Welcome to the August 2016 podcast from the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. This month, our podcast features abstracts of four scientific articles published in the August issues of the journal, as well as commentaries by Dr. Kelly G. Vince on the article entitled Midterm Results of Porous Tantalum Femoral Cones in Revision Total Knee Arthroplasty, and Dr. Freddie H. Fu on the article entitled A Randomized Multicenter Trial Comparing Autologous Chondrocyte Implantation with Microfracture Long-Term Follow-Up at 14 to 15 Years. Be sure to check out this month's Current Concepts Review article on Advances in 3D Printed Pediatric Prostheses for Upper Extremity Differences by Dr. Kara Tanaka and Dr. Nina lightdale mirick The authors note that the prohibitive cost of cutting-edge prostheses prevents many children with a limb difference from obtaining them. However, new developments in 3D printing have the potential to increase the accessibility, customization, and procurement of such devices. Children with upper limb differences are ideal candidates for currently available 3D printed devices because they quickly damage and outgrow prostheses, and the low cost of 3D printing makes repairs and upgrades substantially more affordable. As the crowdsourced innovation movement of 3D printing of prostheses surges forward, physicians and medical practitioners should become familiar with the possibilities of 3D printed devices in order to determine the benefits and utility for their patients. In this issue, JBJS.org presents a new image quiz, a nine-year-old boy with lumps at the base of the fingers. Be sure to visit us online to access these features, as well as the full text of the scientific articles you are about to discover in the following podcast. Next, you'll hear the first abstract of four that are being presented in this podcast. This abstract is from the article entitled, Midterm Results of Porous Tantalum Femoral Cones in Revision Total Knee Arthroplasty by Dr. G. David Potter and Associates. Investigation performed at the Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota. Severe bone loss during a revision total knee arthroplasty, TKA, remains a challenging problem. The purpose of this study was to determine the midterm clinical outcomes, fixation, as evaluated radiographically, and survivorship of tantalum femoral cones used during revision TKAs in patients with severe femoral bone loss. From 2003 to 2011, 159 tantalum metaphyseal femoral cones were implanted in 157 patients at a single institution. Knee society scores, radiographic results, and implant survivorship were analyzed. Two patients were lost to follow-up. 19 died of causes unrelated to the surgery, but had been followed for greater than two years, and thus were included in the study. The mean age at the time of the index surgery was 64 years, and 82 patients were male. The mean duration of follow-up was five years. The mean knee society score increased from 47 preoperatively to 65 at the most recent follow-up evaluation. Radiographically, all 134 unrevised femoral cones were seen to be well fixed without any evidence of loosening. At five years, 23 cones had been revised, 14 because of infection, 6 because of aseptic loosening of the cone, and 3 because of ligamentous instability. The five-year survivorship was 96% when the endpoint was revision of the cone due to aseptic loosening, 84% when it was revision of the cone for any reason, and 70% when it was any reoperation. Conclusions In what the authors believed to be the largest series of such implants, femoral cones provided a durable and reliable option for metaphyseal fixation during revision TKA with severe femoral bone loss. Aseptic failure of the femoral cone was associated with use of a hinge TKA in a patient with a type 3 bone defect. Next, you'll hear a commentary by Dr. Kelly G. Vince on the article entitled Midterm Results of Porous Tantalum Femoral Cones in Revision Total Knee Arthroplasty. This is Dr. Kelly Vince providing commentary for the August 2016 JBJS podcast. I will be providing commentary on the article entitled Midterm Results of Porous Tantalum Femoral Cones in Revision Total Knee Arthroplasty. The title of my commentary is Please Teach Us More. The challenge of bone loss in revision surgery is fixation, not substitution. Potter et al. are to be commended on their clinical update, and the senior authors are to be applauded for creating practical implants from an extraordinary technology, porous metal. Cemented metal femoral block augments up to 10 millimeters in thickness remain useful 
on the posterior aspect of the femoral component to stabilize the flexion gap, and on the distal aspect of the component for proximal to distal positioning as a means of managing the extension gap. These augments fulfill a kinematic role by occupying space and bringing functional tension to the soft tissue envelope. Allografts were developed for contained and massive defects from oncologic surgery when cemented blocks were inadequate. They reconstitute anatomy unless they are resorbed, and they generally unite with a limited zone of creeping substitution. They do not reconstitute normal bone, but they do enhance fixation by a transition of interfaces, host to graft, and then polymethylmethacrylate cement fixing metal to the allograft. In contrast, cement on sclerotic bone is unreliable. Porous metals accomplish the same goal, but with greater mechanical reliability. They may prove of even greater use as fixation devices than as augmentations. The senior authors of this study have extraordinary experience in revision knee arthroplasty. The performance of more than 2,500 revision knee arthroplasties by them and others at their institution is remarkable. However, only 5.9% of the cases were judged to have defects that were sufficiently severe to require porous femoral augmentation, confirming the cautious judgment on the part of the surgeons. Identifying the six patients out of every 100 undergoing revision who can benefit from this expensive implant is challenging. How do we decide to use a femoral cone? All 159 cases in this study handed Anderson Orthopedic Research Institute type 2B or type 3 defect. How many patients with similar defects did not receive cones and how did they fare? When should we return to using structural allografts? The AORI classification was an important contribution 17 years ago, but it may need updating for new technology. The critical regions for condylar fixation of a femoral component are the posterior condyles. A loose femoral component subsides anteriorly and proximally inside the femoral epicondyles, leaving an earmuff-type configuration. This could almost be interpreted as an AORI type 1 defect, which is defined as having intact metaphyseal cortical bone. The oval cross-section of trabecular metal cones resists rotation in the medullary canal, a feature that is not specified by the AORI. RI system. The definition of AORI type 2 as, quotes, damaged metaphyseal cortical bone, end quotes, raises the question of how much. AORI type 3 defects are described as, quotes, deficient metaphyseal cortical bone with major loss of femoral condyle, end quotes, but this does not specify if the collateral ligaments are gone. Potter et al. helpfully specified, quotes, involvement of both condyles and at the level of or proximal to the epicondyles, end quotes, as a definition for type 3 defects in their study. Perhaps they could modify the classification so that it is pertinent to this new technology. The patients in this study were treated with fully cemented stem extensions, most commonly 100 millimeters in length a technique that one of the authors reported prior to the introduction of trabecular metal cones. The strong conceptual work of Morgan Jones et al. would probably identify this technique as three full zones of fixation. Although this exceeds the recommendation they made for two zones, aseptic loosening was still a challenge in some cases reported here. There is much potential information in this formidable series. If the only message received is that the five-year survivorship was 96% for those femoral trabecular metal cones, 
we will miss so much. It would be useful to know the post-revision alignment on long leg views that were obtained. We know from findings at the same institution that precise neutral mechanical alignment is not essential in primary arthroplasty. This is also true for revisions that may have failed from medial overload and loosening. How do we reconcile the failure of six of 56 hinged implants with the enthusiasm for those implants from other centers? I have a career-long interest in revision knee arthroplasty, and I want to thank the authors for their contribution. The results of revision knee arthroplasty are sometimes difficult to divine, and this paper improves our understanding. These implants are extraordinary, but they are not talismans with magical qualities. We have to learn when and how to use them. We must encourage the authors of this paper to teach us more. Next, you'll hear the second abstract of four that are being presented in this podcast. This abstract is from the article entitled, The Effect of the Risser Stage on Bracing Outcome in Adolescent Idiopathic Scoliosis by Dr. Lori A. Carroll and Associates. Investigation performed at the Texas Scottish Rite Hospital for Children, Dallas, Texas. To determine the influence of the Risser sign on the need for surgery in children wearing orthoses for the treatment of adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, AIS, data on compliance with brace wear were collected and analyzed. 168 patients were prospectively enrolled at the time that brace wear had been prescribed and were followed until the cessation of bracing or the need for surgery. Inclusion criteria were a curve magnitude between 25 degrees and 45 degrees, a Risser stage of zero, one or two, and, if female, less than one year post-menarche at the time of brace prescription. Compliance was measured using thermal monitors. The prevalence of surgery, or progression to a curve magnitude of 50 degrees or more, was 44.2% for patients at Risser Stage 0, 6.9% for patients at Risser Stage 1, and 0% for patients at Risser Stage 2. Brace wear averaged 11.3, 13.4, and 14.2 hours per day for the Risser Stage 0, 1, and 2 groups, respectively. While the groups had no difference in initial curve magnitude, more patients at Risser Stage 0 had progression to surgery than did patients at Risser Stage 1 or Stage 2 despite bracing. 26 of 62 Risser Stage 0 patients who wore braces 12.9 or more hours per day had progression to surgery. 10 patients at Risser Stage 0 with closed triradiate cartilage wore braces 18 or more hours per day and none underwent surgery. In comparison, 7 of 10 patients at Risser Stage 0 with open triradiate cartilage and similar daily brace wear underwent surgery. Of 9 patients at Risser Stage 0 with open triradiate cartilage who wore braces 12.9 or more hours daily for curves measuring less than 30 degrees, 7 had a non-surgical outcome. Conclusions Patients at Risser Stage 0 are at risk for surgery despite brace wear. In these patients, 12.9 hours of daily wear, the number of hours linked with a successful outcome in the bracing and adolescent idiopathic scoliosis trial, did not prevent surgery. Patients with open triradiate cartilage were at highest risk, especially those with curves of 30 degrees or greater. Risser stage zero patients should be prescribed a minimum of 18 hours of brace wear. Bracing should be initiated for curves of less than 30 degrees in patients at Risser stage zero, especially those with open triradiate cartilage. Next, you'll hear the third abstract of four that are being presented in this podcast. This abstract is from the article entitled, A Randomized Multicenter Trial Comparing Autologous Chondrocyte Implantation with Microfracture, Long-Term Follow-Up at 14 to 15 Years by Dr. Gunnar Knudsen and Associates. Investigation performed at the University of Tromsø, the Arctic University of Norway, and University Hospital North Norway, Tromsø. St. Olaf's Hospital, Trondheim University Hospital, Trondheim, Oslo University Hospital, Oslo, and Deaconess University Hospital, Bergen, Bergen, Norway. The management of cartilage and osteochondral lesions in the knee remains problematic and controversial. The author's group reported the two-year and five-year results of a randomized controlled trial comparing autologous chondrocyte implantation, ACI, and microfracture in patients with focal femoral cartilage injuries. The objective of the present study was to report the long-term results. 80 patients with a single symptomatic chronic cartilage defect on the femoral condyle without general osteoarthritis were included in the study at the time of the index operation. The authors used the International Cartilage Repair Society, Lysholm, 
short form 36, and Tegner forms to collect data at the time of inclusion and at follow-up evaluations. Standing weight-bearing radiographs were evaluated for evidence of osteoarthritis according to the method described by Kelgren and Lawrence. For the long-term follow-up in 2014, the authors used the Cineflexor frame to standardize the radiographs. The operation was considered to have failed if a reoperation was performed because of symptoms from a lack of healing of the treated defect. At the long-term follow-up evaluation, no significant differences between the treatment groups were detected with respect to the results on the clinical scoring systems. At the 15-year evaluation, there were 17 failures in the ACI group compared with 13 in the microfracture group. The authors observed that more total knee replacements were needed in the ACI group than in the microfracture group. The surviving patients in both groups, i.e., those who had not had a failure, had significant improvement in the clinical scores compared with baseline. 57% of the surviving patients in the ACI group and 48% of such patients in the microfracture group had radiographic evidence of early osteoarthritis. The difference was not significant. Conclusions The survivors in both groups improved their clinical scores in the short, medium, and long-term evaluations, and no significant difference between the groups was found at the long-term follow-up. The risk of treatment failure and the frequency of radiographic osteoarthritis are problematic. The findings raise serious concerns regarding the efficacy of these procedures in delaying osteoarthritis and preventing further surgery. Continued basic and clinical research is needed in this field. Next, you'll hear a commentary by Dr. Freddie H. Fu on the article entitled, a randomized multicenter trial comparing autologous chondrocyte implantation with microfracture, long term follow up at 14 to 15 years. This is Dr. Freddy Fu providing commentary for the August 2016 JBJS podcast. I will be providing commentary on the article entitled Randomized Multicenter Trial. Comparing Autologous Chondrocyte Implantation with Microfracture Long-Term Follow-Up at 14 to 15 Years The title of my commentary is ACI versus Microfracture, The Debate Continues Because of the limited regenerative potential of articular cartilage, management of the symptomatic chondro defects places us in a very large challenging situation. The quest for the ideal treatment modality in which mechanically functional highland cartilage can be regenerated around and in the defect site is ongoing. In the last few years, multiple products and techniques they claim to provide improved outcomes but have never been tested in controlled trials have entered the market. Microfracture, autologous, chondrocyte implantation, ACI, and the osteochondral autograph transfer system, OATS, have been around for the last two decades. They have been studied extensively. But level 1 studies are few in number. In a systemic review of level 1 and 2 studies, Magnuson uh, et al. concluded that no one technique produces superior clinical results for these defects. Results were found to be inconsistent and contradictory, which could be due to multiple factors such as heterogeneity of the study sample, location of lesions, associated procedures, and age of the lesion, to name a few. In this study, the authors present the 15-year results of the randomized control trial RCT comparing ACI and microfracture. The study is an extension of previously published two and five year follow up investigations. Consistent with the previously published results, the authors showed no differences between treatment groups in any of the outcome measures. However, they reported a failure rate of 42.5% and 32.5% in the ACI and microfracture groups, respectively. Richter than half of the patients have radiographic evidence of osteoarthritis as determined by the Kilgren and Lawrence scale. Limitations of this study are the lack of a control group, an ambiguous definition of failure in a small number of patients. If we follow the results of the study, microfracture is the clear winner. 
being a single stage low cost arthroscopic procedure compared with ACI, which is technically demanding, expensive, can cost from $20,000 to $40,000 and associated with increased morbidity, giving the, then a two-stage operation is required. With the initial stage usually performed by mini arthrotomy, in this ever-evolving field of health regeneration, it is possible that the techniques used in the study more than 15 years old are no longer relevant today. When the study was designed, ACI was only a few years old. It is a technically demanding procedure and the technique has evolved over the years. With a failure rate of approximately 60% from one of the four centers in the study, the learning curve could have contributed towards poor results. Also, first-generation ACI, which is known to have a higher risk of hypertrophy and delamination in comparison with the second and third generations of ACI, was used in the study. Bassett et al. in the level 1 RCI found superior results with first-generation ACI in comparison with the microfracture for the treatment of the lesions of more than 4 cm at 2 years. The condition of the subcontrol plate is an important factor co to consider. If it is compromised, then OX or osteochondral allograft may be procedure of choice as it can restore the entire osteochondral unit. In this study, 28% of the patients have osteochondral defects and the authors did not mention whether the ACI technique was modified, i.e. a sandwich technique was used. If the standard ACI technique was used in the presence of a compromised subcontrol plate, the lesion would have healed with poor quality cartilage and possibly led to earlier failure. The size of the lesion is another important variable. Cousin et al. at the two-year follow-up of the same RCT showed that lesion correcting 4 cm did worse with microfracture, but ACI demonstrated no correlation between the size of the lesion and the clinical outcome. Bassett et al. noticed similar results. Goya et al. in the systemic review of level 1 and 2 studies found that small sized lesions in younger patients have good results with microfracture in the short term, but treatment failures increased and osteoarthritis was observed after 5 years. As evidence stands currently, microfracture has favorable results for small, less than 4 cm contained control defects. ACI has more favorable outcomes than microfracture for larger contained defects. Management of these defects should be individualized, dependent on the size and site of the lesion. Patient age, type of sports, level of sport activities, chronicity, condition of subcentral bone, and most importantly, the stability of alignment of the knee. Nevertheless, this landmark study represents to our knowledge, the longest follow-up investigation comparing microfracture to ACI to date. Perhaps even more impressive is the dropout rate of only 2.5% after 15 years. The completeness of this well-designed randomized study is not only commendable, but also important in providing an understanding of the long-term effects of the treatments investigated. Next, you'll hear the fourth abstract of four that are being presented in this podcast. This abstract is from the article entitled, A Meta-Analysis on the Use of Gabapentinoids for the Treatment of Acute Postoperative Pain Following Total Knee Arthroplasty by Dr. Thomas W. Hamilton and Associates. Investigation performed at the Nuffield Department of Orthopedics, Rheumatology and Musculoskeletal Sciences, University of Oxford, Oxford, United Kingdom. Total knee arthroplasty is a painful procedure with approximately half of patients reporting severe pain during the early postoperative period. Gabapentinoids are used as an adjunct for the management of acute pain in approximately half of enhanced recovery programs. The authors performed a meta-analysis to assess the effectiveness and safety of gabapentinoids for the treatment of acute postoperative pain following total knee arthroplasty. Randomized controlled trials of patients undergoing elective primary total knee arthroplasty that compared the use of the gabapentinoid class of drugs with that of placebo were retrieved, with 12 studies meeting inclusion criteria. The primary outcome was pain intensity with activity at 48 hours following the surgical procedure. The secondary outcomes included pain intensity at other time points, opioid consumption, knee function, incidence of chronic pain, and adverse events. 
No difference in pain score at 12, 24, 48, or 72 hours following the surgical procedure was seen between gabapentin and placebo. Although pregabalin was associated with reduced pain scores at 24 and 48 hours, this corresponded to a reduction of 0.5 point at 24 hours and 0.3 point at 48 hours on an 11-point numeric rating scale, which was assessed as not clinically important. Overall, no clinically relevant reduction in pain scores was associated with the use of gabapentinoids. Likewise, gabapentinoids were associated with a small but not clinically important reduction in cumulative opioid consumption at 48 hours. There was no difference in knee flexion at 48 hours or in the incidence of chronic pain at 3 months or 6 months associated with the use of gabapentinoids. Although gabapentinoids were associated with a significant reduction in the incidence of nausea, pregabalin was also associated with a significant clinically relevant increase in the risk of sedation. Conclusions On the basis of this meta-analysis, the authors found no evidence to support the routine use of gabapentinoids in the management of acute pain following total knee arthroplasty. Thank you for listening to this JBJS podcast. Please visit www.jbjs.org for commentary and perspective on many of the articles presented in this podcast and for more content of interest.